in the form of you know attending it or delivering a talk and it's it's always an learning experience and i'm really sorry that we actually decided to do it on a sunday morning and jaipur especially you know finally after such a hot weather now has very good uh, weather pleasant today actually so it's not the best of the times to have a talk but you know still let's let's you know try doing it and uh, have it as informal as possible let's you know you can stop me wherever you wish to and at the same time you know before i start let me thank dr janki ram who actually you know made us think and present this whole two lecture series it was his idea to do this and you know it's really sad that he has a webinar you know almost at the same time but we'll just continue with this because this is anyhow to basic a talk for him and you know we will be trying to cover all the basic aspects and you know slowly go on to the more advanced parts of hsc temporal bone so it's just a topic which is very close to me and uh, before i start let me acknowledge the google and the internet for you know various things which i am going to present out here this would obviously not have been possible without my radiology colleagues and the various patients also let me thank time publication right here because i happened to write a book on radiology of temporal bone recently and it's because of that that i really had to read a lot and uh, you know the people who worked with me on that book really thank them out for you know making me interested in more interested in this field now before i you know begin let me let me just ask you a few questions because these are the questions which i had in my mind during my ms and i could really never understand how this really happens many a times so if i you know were to and you may not answer it if you wish you can unmute yourself i hope you are allowed to do that and you may answer it or you may just you know think in your mind for now as to what do you think forms the medial wall of sinus tympani uh i could never imagine my education period that you know which structure would be lying medial to the sinus tympani and how it would really and radiology actually help me realize which structure lies medial to the sinus tympani similarly i would you know if and i would be happy if somebody could unmute and really tell me this is what is the best radiological investigation to identify a cholesteatoma though we are going to discuss only hsd temporal bone here but this is one thing which which has been changing over you know every few months and what's the best radiological investigation to identify does anybody know that I mean, what would you get to do if you want to do if you want to really identify a cholesteatoma on radiology what do you think is the best thing sir sir are they allowed to unmute themselves yes sir yes sir. Can make it. okay so anybody you know what do you think is the best radiological investigation to identify a cholesteatoma in temporal bone okay is anybody there or sab so rahe yeah yes, a lot of people have unmuted okay so yeah uh, sir as far as you know it is in image mri sorry hi monish hi how are you vijay sagar here yeah yeah i can i know nice yes. to hear you on a sunday morning oh god <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to hear you so <laughs> i mean it, it's the diffusion weighted image mri is the one let me know yes yeah, so, so i think we have given two uh, choices what yeah. is epi and what is non epi so epi are eco planar images and the non epi are the non eco planar images and you know it's dw mri is as you correctly mentioned that's the best you know way to identify a cholesteatoma if you're looking for a more specific thing then non epi dw mri that's a non epi diffusion weighted would make a lot of sense to really look at the diffusion restriction which you want so it's a more specific kind of dw mri which you want and recently i was in in another kind of a conversation with a very good radiologist in india and he was talking about adc map right and i'm going to discuss this as we you know go ahead with this talk and adc map in the recent literature is actually showing even better and more specific you know, results than non epi dw mri 
right so so non epa dwl yeah. mri is a more specific dwl mri yeah. which you really want and adc map is probably a, an edge better than the non epa dwl mri okay now this is not for out of vidya sagar right okay he is one of the most knowledgeable guys i know but you know where do you think the oval window opens you know these are the four things and we we have read in our undergraduate and even post graduate books you know where is it really lying in relation to is it the scalar tympani or is it the scalar vestibuli of the basal turn we all know the round window is in relation to the scalar tympani of the basal turn and then the you know the sound travels along the helicotrema like here and then you know let me just let me just draw it here the sound would go in from here it would reach the helicotrema we all know the traveling wave and then it comes back and you know maybe hits the oval window right this is what is happening when when a sound is traveling inside the cochlea so where do you round window is in scalar tympani right where do you think is the oval window the scalar tympani or the scalar vestibuli or you know the other options could be a saccule or a posterior semicircular canal where do you think the oval window opens in anybody right not vidya sagar <laughs> It, just speak out whatever you think sir, is happening scala vestibuli hello sir good morning sir hi good morning yeah so dr prena right it's yes, the scala vestibule of the basal turn of the cochlea right and you know that is what we what we usually believe is happening and it's actually not what really happens and you know the good radiology morning, will tell us in a much better manner on that and the the real answer to that would be the saccule right and and i uh, and that's the reason why we think it's scalar vestibuli our undergraduate books actually tell us you know some kind of a diagram which i have shown here is that it's right there on the other end of the basal turn where the sound would reach and hit the oval window and that's why i for a long long time always thought that you know it's got to be the scalar vestibuli why do we talk about when we are doing stapedotomy is a relation with the saccule and utricle and it was really confusing for me and then you know when you look at the ct temporal bones you start realizing how it is the saccule and i'll try to show that you know when we really go ahead with this lecture and and believe me i for a very very long time thought it had to be the scalar vestibule of the basal turn right and the reason why this all happens is uh we all have a very very different way of reading the radiology right and i really compare it to these eating these noodles because we all have a very different way of eating our own chow mein or noodles and it's really funny to see somebody else actually eating those so you here you have you know the patients trying to read it it's really fascinating when, when either you watch somebody eating the noodles in a very good way or reading radiology and right from our day of birth in radiology or for that matter temporal bone radiology and maybe till we stop operating or stop seeing the patients we will keep on learning newer and newer things ultimately we all have our own way of reading the radiology and nothing is right or wrong you just need to be you know very uh, comfortable as to how you want to eat your noodles or how you want to read your radiology so to master the otology these four things are obviously important you need to understand the anatomy you need to read your radiology well you need to analyze it again and then only do you operate now you know there are it's easier said than done and it's very difficult to understand the 3d anatomy of temporal bone we we may go ahead with dissections we may try to read various books you know all these are not something very very comfortable and you know what i did initially and many a times i do prefer even now and it's fun to play around with is to use softwares like these very easily available if you want i can you know share these with you so with this what you can do is actually this is you know the 3d temporal bone inner structures which have been you know made into this software i can just stop it from rotating i can move around this so if i were to see this this is your external artery canal that's your tympanic membrane these blue are the ossicles and then you see the facial and the cauda right if i want the tympanic membrane and ec to disappear i can just click here and they disappear right i hope you can see that and then you want to look at the posterior tympanum with the facial recess you see the round window appearing right here if you want to see the tensor tympani how it really travels you see you can see the cauda tympani you know the cauda tympani going between the malleus and incus out here the facial just above the oval window out here and you can see the stapedius in in the purple or the violet color the tensor tympani coming just above the eustachian tube taking off from the processus cochleariformis and then hitting the you know the malleus 
right and so you can just play around with it you can you know make these carotids or juggler whatever you want to disappear oops this annotate the shit content okay i don't mind approve right and so this is you know what something you can play around with these kind of softwares so it it is really oh, somebody did something who is mv okay request the audience not to click annotate option please uh, yeah, somebody did that and it's some mv who is mv i mean i hope it's not milan with vasant kirtane sir but you know somebody if you could you know just kind of um not annotate it would make it easier yeah thank you so um, okay now let's so these are the kind of radiology i cannot do unannotate now i have no to do okay let me just check i should be able to do something about it i don't know what happened okay fine so we're back and so if i want i can really you know go about rotating this the way i wish to and i can make the things disappear the way i wish to so if i want the whole of the middle ear to go oh god somebody is changing and changing okay i don't want anybody to annotate right you can just ask me and i'll do it for you so i can make the middle ear disappear i can make it appear again i can play around with this kind of a software i can move all these structures and even if i am not knowing because in dissections you may not go really deep in i can see the whole of facial nerve in relation to the cochlea and the vestibule and these are things which are which are you know for at least for me they were very very helpful and i still love using these softwares then you go to see the temporal bones right once you understand the anatomy well good temporal and now there are various terminologies which are used when you talk about temporal bone ct scan these include sections ounce field units windows window width and level right if you want to sound knowledgeable right or if you want to discuss with a radiologist you need to know what these things mean we all know what sections are right we all know what are axial sections what are coronal sections what are sagittal sections right and you know can you can anybody tell me i mean i wish somebody could you know unmute and tell me axial sections right what do you mean by axial sections you have a horizontal plane right are the axial sections parallel to it or they perpendicular to it how are the axial sections really taken anybody just chip in okay i i don't mind if you are answering it right or wrong right how are the axial sections taken what's the plane of the axial sections is it parallel to the horizontal it is perpendicular to the horizontal how do you go about it uh hello sir it's parallel to a lateral semicircular canal so would that would that be parallel to the horizontal plane then i agree when you're saying that but do you think then it's horizontal because you cannot see the horizontal canal when the patient is lying right you need to make your settings before that so is it parallel to the horizontal plane right you know that's something i'm happy you actually mentioned it right so let me just go about telling what dr vignesh just mentioned now we all know that you know you see this ice cream cone appearance here right this is what the ice cream cone appearance would be if you were to cut it and this is the plane of the lateral semicircular canal and which dr vignesh just mentioned is the plane for the axial sections so that's kind of at 30 degree to the horizontal plane let me just clarify it again if this is the skull which you are seeing the routine horizontal would be this line you know reed strandberg line or the friedberg line whatever you want to use it would be this line would be you know somewhere like the superior border of the esc and the inferior border of the orbital rim right this is the true horizontal which is usually used axial section as dr vignesh mentioned mentioned would be at 30 degrees because the lateral semicircular canal is at 30 degrees to the true horizontal so this is where your axial sections would be and similarly your coronal sections would be perpendicular to this 30 degree line so it's not going to be perpendicular to the horizontal it's not a true vertical again it's a perpendicular to the 30 degree it's kind of 120 degrees to the true horizontal so nccct pns would be a true horizontal and a true vertical a ct temporal bone is 30 degrees to the true horizontal and true vertical vertical right i hope you could understand what i'm trying to say and when 
you know when uh, dr vignesh mentioned it's going we do this because you want to see the lateral semicircular canal in the plane because we see it completely right we see the signet ring appearance which it commonly called as and that's because we are in that plane right so this is the plane of your axial and coronal uh, planes sections and then you have the hounsfield units you need to remember a few of them it's always good to know that so air is at minus 1000 hausfield units and bone is at plus 1000 hausfield units so that's the, you know the range of hausfield units which we usually play around with water is at zero hausfield units right and everything obviously would be in between so fat and lung are obviously not as dense and therefore oops don't make me annotate Oh, what do I do again? Okay, so okay, whatever. So air is at minus thousand, bone is at plus thousand, fat is at minus fifty, lung is minus five hundred, water zero, and usual soft tissue should be plus fifty. So if you remember air, water, and bone, you can actually you know just mix and match the other things. But these three should be very clear in your mind, and that is where we play around with. Okay, I need to do something. Somebody, this annotation is creating a problem for me. Okay, let me just try it. You yeah, announce who who has clicked that annotate option, sir. I will expel them because unfortunately we cannot uh, disable that option in this. I know, I know. That's okay. That's okay. So now we have, uh, you know, when you talk about a higher resolution CT, what does it mean? By definition, it could be 0.5 to 2 millimeters. Obviously, when you're talking about ear, it cannot be 2 millimeters. You would always want it way lesser, right? Somewhere around 0.5 is very good to have, or maybe maximum 0.7. But you want real thin sliced CT images. That's a width which you want. By high resolution, we mean a very high spatial frequency and algorithms. We, I don't want you to go into that. We are able to achieve two things to look at very small objects that are close together and to accentuate the contrast between tissues of different densities. So air and bone should look different. And I'll just talk about how we really, you know, went about doing this. If you look at the soft tissue window, right, this is what a soft tissue window would be. You would want the house field range from minus 125 to plus 225, right? If you could see this, this is the range of house field units for a soft tissue window. For a bone window, you are looking at minus 700 to 1300 because you're looking more at the bone. So for temporal bone, it's obvious that you want a bone window, which technically would be minus 700 to plus 1300 units, Hounsfield units, right? That's what you would be looking at. Don't go into details of that. That's for the radiologist to do, but you should just be knowing what that really means. Why is it that important is because if you look at this, you can't really identify what that is. Because that's a very, very vague picture. Look at this and it becomes much better. And then you have this. And it's obvious these are orange slices, right? Now, these are just the different views of maybe Hounsfield units in which this photograph has been taken. Look at the radiology. This is what a soft tissue window in temporal bone would be like. This is what a bone window of the same section would be like. right? And that's the difference. If you're looking for a temporal bone, many a times we do get CT scans just like this above picture, which have no sense at all. And this is what a bone window would look like, which shows you so many other things. So you want a bone window. If you don't get it, ask the radiologist to provide you from this, from their, you know, uh, softwares, which they have in their computers or consoles. And if it would have been colored like this, it obviously makes a lot of sense. Now, even, you know, if I am not seeing something, I would be able to notice the different colors and then, you know, make the best use out of it. However, is it really possible? You know, it's actually possible. And especially in the initial phases, things like these are really helpful. You know, how do you have these things? Is this is the usual. If you go to the CT room in your hospital, or the institute where you are studying, you have a console which shows the coronal, axial and CT images all together, right? And if you click on one of these, the coronal and sagittal will change accordingly. However, what this software does is, for example, if I go from superior to inferior, so 
the best way to read a ct temporal bone is to go from superior to inferior right and if you're going from superior to inferior the first structures which you start seeing are the mastoid ear cells right we all know that you go much more inferiorly what are we seeing okay tell me what we are saying somebody has to speak up now what are you seeing this this structure this line like thing which is coming right you see this line coming in between what is this? superior semicircle wonderful so that's a superior semicircle canal and that's the best thing to see right and and you know uh, i would now if you don't really understand it with this software you can actually color whatever you wish to right if i go in all on mode i really get a green color for this right and it's and when i when i take my cursor to that it shows me i'm looking at the superior semicircle canal i click on this and obviously it shows me what where it, where i am on the coronal and the sidal sections if i want i can just go ahead and click the vestibular system right and everything else would then you know become unclear let me just go how to do that right this is the ill sections i go to the all off thing again and then i just click the vestibular system right so now only the vestibular system is getting colored rest all is black and white so for me to really learn let's see let's see when you go to one inferior turn you see the anterior and posterior limbs of the superior semicircle canal you see them separating further away and then you see the posterior semicircle canal which you all know joins the superior semicircle canal to form the crest commune out here right so you can actually see that you can actually take your cursor and it will show you where you are so that's your posterior semicircle canal that's your common crest or the crest commune that's your superior semicircle canal the anterior limb you can also see the starting of the internoitry canal is so these are very good softwares to have right but because majority of us do not have it right now so let me for this time let me just go to the all of normal mode which we see right and when we start superiorly as dr santosh mentioned we have the superior semicircle canal we go inferior and we start seeing these limbs separating right we go inferior they separate further and what you start seeing now is the posterior semicircle canal right you see this structure that's a posterior just starting to appear moving towards the superior semicircle canal which we just discussed so crest commune posterior semicircle canal these are the non ampullated ends of both these canals when they are meeting now remember when you are seeing this kind of a structure just inferior to these cuts you would see similar structure appearing this is the posterior semicircle canal and this is the crest commune go more inferior see right you see these this structure coming in you have this another similar structure coming in right what we saw just above this was the posterior semicircle canal joining the superior from the crest commune what we have just inferior that's your posterior canal that's your vestibule and the common crest what we have posterior to this is the vestibular aqueduct right this part now need to remember that your vestibular aqueduct would usually start appearing when your vestibule starts appearing it would not appear before that if you're seeing a similar structure from the posterior part coming in that's your crest commune and the posterior semicircle canal right if you go inferior to that you have the vestibular aqueduct and you have the vestibule here you have obviously the internal costa canal and we all know what comes out of the internal costa canal is the facial nerve so you will see your labyrinthine segment of facial right here so that's your labyrinthine segment when you go follow that you will reach the genu area right so that's your genu so you have the meatal segment in this you would not be able to see that that's obvious then you have okay bikash when you ask me this is you know there are various such softwares available right i i happened to be at a university in us when they were developing this and this is around maybe 4 years back and i got them from that if you want i can you know share this with all of you and this would be you know something which would be really fun to play around with and so this is you know when this is where your meatal segment of facial nerve would be which you can't see in a ct scan because soft tissues can't be differentiated well you have your labyrinthine segment of the facial arising from it we all know it forms the genu right across that so that's your genu which is appearing so in this section what all you can see you can see the mastoid ear cells let's not discuss that you see the entrum also here we not so discuss that what you start seeing the posterior canal we saw that we saw the crest commune so the vestibule so the beginning of the lateral semicircle canal we see the vestibular aqueduct which is going to join the vestibule in the next section 
internal acoustic canal the labyrinthine segment of the facial and the genu just starting to appear right and you go to the next cut the things become much better now and these are very important things to see right you have the vestibular aqueduct so see the vestibular aqueduct is appearing when you have the vestibule you do not want to see this when you don't have a vestibule in an axial section this is what you want to see but you also see the signet ring appearance classically for the little semicircular canal with the vestibule now remember when you're going in from you know cortical mesorectomy we go from here you see this kind of an interim and then you see the bulge of the little semicircular canal right so clinically when you're operating on this you want to go through here drill all these cells enter the interim and see the dome of the little semicircular canal right this is what we classically see and we see this in radiology as well then you have the internal auditory canal right you have the labyrinthine segment of facial you have the genu and then you have the tympanic segment starting right so labyrinthine segment genu tympanic segment what comes from the genu which nerve comes out of the genu of the facial nerve okay anybody genu the first genu of the facial nerve gives rise to which branch okay abhi tak sab bol rahe the na so i hope you have not slept now first genu facial nerve which branch do we get out of it guys gspn okay chandrika thank you you can unmute and say if you wish to but gspn which is the one which comes out so you would actually it's not labeled in this software but when you see structure like this you know when it's present out here this is where you know the gspn is coming and going anteriorly towards the middle cranial fossa area right so that's your first genu let me just revise it again first genu sorry the labyrinthine the first genu the tympanic segment starting and the gspn anything anterior to this labyrinthine segment or anterior to the internal acoustic canal in the inner ear structures would be the cochlear structure anything posterior would be the vestibular structure so all these structures will always be vestibular all these structures here will always be cochlear right let me just tell you that this is the cochlea right? so we all know that now as you see now this is what this software taught me 5 years ago and i really realized it after reading various books again that this is what happens the first turn of the cochlea which you see is the middle turn it's not the apical turn it's not the basal turn it's the middle turn of the cochlea which you see right and why does it happen because it's very intriguing that i would rather be happier to see it's going to be the basal or the apical why should the middle turn lying the superior most part of the cochlea and you would actually dis when you dissect the bones you would actually be able to make out i would try to show this in a few diagrams after we finish this radiology issue here but remember the first structure of cochlea when you coming from superior to inferior which you see is the middle turn of the cochlea right it is not the basal it's not the apical the middle turn right and that's what this software labels so and these are the ossicles right you have the malleus you have the incus right and i'm very fond of asking the students during postgraduate exam facial nerve so you should all be knowing where your facial nerve lies and i'll just tell you what's the easiest way to identify a facial nerve right we go to this section now when we all know all of you would easily identify the ice cream cone appearance so the cone being the incus the scoop being the malleus that's the head and that's the body right and that's where your editors would lie just you know behind this malleus sorry the incus the short process of incus right and this is where your other air cells would be now whenever you see the ice cream cone appearance right this is the best turn to identify the tympanic segment of the facial because 99% of times that's your tympanic so if you're seeing the ice cream cone appearance which we all can see easily you would see your tympanic segment of facial right here okay so that's your tympanic segment of facial that's your malleus and incus forming the ice cream cone appearance so if you want to see the tympanic segment of facial 
you see this and you would never miss it right you would always get it let's see the other structures which we are able to see this is the semicircular canal the posterior canal is still continuing the superior is gone we are way more inferior you see the vestibule see the internal acoustic canal you see the three turns now right the middle the basal and slowly the apical is coming here right we start seeing all the three turns now you see a structure out here that's a black structure out here do not confuse this with you know some important structure this would either be a pneumatized bone of the temporal part or sorry the petrous part of temporal or this would just be you know a bone marrow pipe thing so this is kind of the grayish thing is the bone marrow out here and this black is the pneumatized air cell you know mesoid air cell which is lying right so these are the structures you know ask me to repeat if you really want me to internal acoustic canal anterior to these are the cochlear structures the various turns and the vestibule lying just posterior more importantly the ice cream cone and the tympanic segment of facial now follow this tympanic segment posteriorly and you would start seeing the vertical segment okay let's just see that now the important part you know the question which i asked i'm not sure who answered that initially probably dr prerna or i don't know i don't remember the name sorry but but when you when you see these structures you start seeing few important things this is your posterior semicircular canal this is your vestibule right and in the vestibule this is the area of the secule now if you can identify the stapes foot plate look at this let me just make it green right this is your stapes suprastructure this is your vestibule more specifically the secule right so the suprastructure secule and then in between you have actually what we call as the stapes foot plate or the oval window so the first you know i remember the question which i asked you initially where does the oval window open or where, what is it in relation to it's not in relation to the scala vestibula of the basal turn of cochlea this is where it will be it will join the secule however it is in relation to the secule okay swati i sorry i can't allow you to annotate right because it's creating issues out here if you want ask me i'll do that for you so your stapes is in relation to your oval window which is in relation to the secule not the scala vestibular basal turn it will follow that so your scala vestibular will join this secule where it will be in relation to it but in reality it is not in relation the second question which asked when we started off was about the sinus tympani now we all know sinus tympani we all know the facial nerve lies lateral to it so you see this that's your genu of the facial nerve and then it will be followed by the vertical segment so if you're looking at it from this direction right you have laterally facial sinus tympani and then when i asked you initially the medial boundary of sinus tympani is the posterior semicircular canal that is how it's really happening so radiology tells i have never seen this in my real life you know i've dissected many bones done a lot of things but to really identify which is what is the medial boundary of a scalar tympani you know I, nothing other than cd temporal bone actually tell me this i've not been that good at temporal bone dissections right so this is my facial nerve laterally you have the sinus tympani and then you have the posterior semicircular canal so this is how your sinus tympani would run remember cp suprastructure the foot plate in between and then the secule you still have these ossicles you have the incus which will join the stapes here right and what do you see here you see this soft tissue out here that's just inferior to the facial is your tensor tympani right you see this curving up you see this from process cochlear reformers it will curve up to reach the malleus right so you see this this is your tensor tympani muscle right and these are the various cochlear structures i would not really want you to go into details of which turn it is but i really want you to know that what you see in the purple shade out here in reality being the dense white dense structure right in this whole cochlea when you see this white dense thing that's your modulus around which the cochlea is rotating or revolving around right and that's the axis of the cochlea so you want to see that white hyperdense structure inside the cochlea which is the modulus okay i hope i'm clear on that so what do you see you see the sinus tympani you see the facial you see the posterior semicircular canal 
you see the stapes, you see the secule, you see the various cochlear structures which are appearing, you see the tensor tympani inferiorly. I will just revise it first once we are through this, right? Oh, sorry. Okay. So go more inferior, you still see the sinus tympani, you still see the posterior semisocanal, you still see the facial. However, what you start seeing now is the stapedius coming out from the pyramid, right? You have the pyramidal structure. You have the stapedius going to the stapes head, right? Head and neck where the stapedius would be now attaching. You see that? So it's so beautifully seen. Facial, the vertical segment, you have the pyramid from which the stapedius is arising and then it goes and hits the stapes neck and head and then you don't see the suprastructure right now. What you start seeing is the whole of basal turn. So the bulge of the basal turn is what forms the promontory. So that's your basal turn. And the dense structure just below this, this thing is the round window. Right? And we'll see that in further cuts. So you need to identify the round window and oval windows. As you know, examiners, I really want my candidate to identify the facial nerve, sinus tympani. Basal turn of cochlea, round window, oval window, right? Ice cream cone appearance, internal acoustic canal. So don't don't miss out on those things. And if you know anything extra, it's always very good. So you have the round window, you have the basal turn, the middle, and the apical. What you see here is the tensor tympani still going, and this you know this pneumatized structure. What do you see from the middle ear going anteriorly towards the area of the nasopharynx? That's obviously the eustachian tube and you know your teachers would always tell you not to drill near the eustachian tube and why do they tell you is because you have your carotid just next to it. So this is your eustachian tube. I we would we would see this. Yeah, Chandrika absolutely right. You have your carotid just next to the eustachian tube, right? So you would actually be seeing that if you drill on this area, you may actually damage the carotid and that's why your teachers would advise you not to drill in that area be very careful let's go one cut inferior let's revise it again you have the air cells you still see this dot like structure what is this this is the vertical segment of the facial what do you see in this part you know this white dot huh? this sorry this dot this grayish blackish dot is probably the coda and what you will see in between these two is actually the facial recess. When you talk about posterior tympanotomy, you go in from here, enter the middle ear, right? And you want to see the round window. So what do you see out here is the vertical segment of the facial. What do you see out here is the probably a coda. And in between is the facial recess, right? So we saw the sinus tympani. We saw its boundaries. Facial, we saw the sinus tympani. And then we saw the posterior semisocanal. canal. What we see here is the facial. We see the coda and in between the facial recess, right? We see the stapedius muscle still present. We see the round window much better. You know, this is the round window niche. So it's the promontory which forms an edge. Can you please show the oval window again? Okay, I'll just do that. Let me just cover the round window. We go back to oval window again, right? This is your round window niche, which is over the basal turn. Right. And if you want to see the oval window, so let me just go back to oval window. Somebody asked me, I'm sorry, I forgot the name. Oval window, right? Oval window will be in this area where you're seeing the posterior semi-canal and the sinus tympani. You see this stapes suprastructure, right? And stapes suprastructure is attaching to the secule. In between this fine structure is the oval window or the stapes foot plate. So what you see is stapes suprastructure and the secule and then you have the stapes foot plate or the oval window. I hope I could you know make you understand this. Let me just revise this cut again. We go back to that cut. You know it's going to be a bit confusing. This is the facial vertical, the sinus tympani, posterior semisocanal, canal, the secule, the suprastructure, right? Suprastructure and the secule in between the oval window, right? Round window is this structure. Round window is in attached, it's a basal turn, inferiorly is usually the scalar tympani and that's where your round window is opening, right? You see the round window, basal turn of cochlea. We know the basal turn can be divided into the uh, scalar tympani inferiorly and scalar vestibular superiorly. 
So we see this inferiorly, right? This is where its round window is seen, opening into the scalar tympani of the basal turn, right? And when we are talking about this, we saw the facial recess through which we go posterior tympanotomy. We try to reach the cochlea, the round window area, and open the cochlea from here. The cochleostomy is done, so you can actually see and go about it inside. Right? I hope I could make you understand what your open was. Again, look at this tensor tympani. We, we know the interior, you know, the wall of the middle ear. You have, yeah, you're welcome, Maha. Uh, you have the tensor tympani. You have the eustachian tube and then you have the carotids. Right? So, you, no drilling here. No messing around the eustachian tube area. This is where your carotid canal is. If you do this, inadvertently it may be very thin at times you may actually injure the carotid and land up in a soup so do not meddle around with the eustachian tube if you really want to deal with it wash that area thoroughly and use blunt instruments no sharp instruments in the area of eustachian tube right then we go inferiorly we see the facial nerve still being present we see the basal of the cochlea with a good promontory out here the carotid now coming over the cochlea, right? And soon we would see that the cochlea disappears and what we see is the bulge of the carotid only. You see still the eustachian tube, right? Just next to the uh, carotid is the eustachian tube and the tensor tympani right there. Now, another thing which you need to remember is there is a structure which now starts coming in and that's your cochlear aqueduct. So we saw the vestibular aqueduct. Yeah, Manaswini, I would share that with you and it would be, okay. Deepesh, uh, I couldn't read your question, you know, completely. It was not showing completely on my screen. We, maybe we can discuss this when we end. So cochlear aqueduct is a structure which comes from the posterior cranial fossa, goes to the cochlea. Usually it would be patent only in the medial part, laterally it would finish off. And when we discuss the cochlear implant radiology in the next lecture, I would tell you when it is called a patent cochlear aqueduct. Let me just tell you right now. Okay, patent cochlear aqueduct is when this whole patency can be seen completely up to the uh, cochlea, right? Which we don't see here. We see normally in all temporal bone CT scan, this would finish off much medially and this is the if you see a patent cochlear aqueduct that is when you have csf gushers happening you know gush that is one of the reasons for it vestibular aqueduct we saw remember vestibular aqueduct we saw coming almost at 90 degrees this is the direction of the vest so vestibular aqueduct runs like this cochlear aqueduct runs like this always remember they are almost perpendicular vestibular aqueduct which will be way superior it will be nearer the vestibule Cochlear aqueduct will be way inferior. However, the cochlear aqueduct is running parallel to the internal acoustic canal. Right? You see the internal acoustic canal and you go inferior, you see the cochlear aqueduct. However, the cochlear duct is much thinner and much smaller, so you don't see it in all the cuts. So, if I were to really go superiorly, right, we keep going superiorly, same level, I am seeing the internal acoustic canal. Right, this is interesting. You keep going inferiorly when it disappears. You see this. This is your cochlear aqueduct, much smaller, much thinner, but at the same level. Don't get confused if by calling this internal acoustic canal. Right, so this is your cochlear aqueduct. No important contents. Right, so let's let's just avoid it. Right, then you have you still see the vertical segment of the facial. Right, you would see your carotid, eustachian tubes, and tensor tympani, which we saw. Now the carotid is forming the bulge in the middle ear. Right, this is your cochlear carotid again, and this is all the facial now. Right, and this is where now the important things start off. Again, you know, sometimes what you know when we begin, we confuse ourselves with is the carotid and the jugular, especially when they come together. So when I'm coming here, you know, I'm seeing this bulge and I'm seeing this bulge. You see these two things. So the thing which is posterior is jugular bulb. The thing what is interior is the carotid canal. So, the structures with C, what did we see? C cochlea, C carotid, they are all anterior. So, that's I mean, kind of an easier way to remember it between the carotid and jugular, especially, is what you see anteriorly. Whatever you are seeing right now, 
this is your carotid this is your jugular though they are very close together right now and your facial is still present right so carotid jugular and the facial so we see this and the condyle right so the third structure with c which you see anteriorly is condyle so condyle carotid and cochlea would always be anterior and other structures would remain posterior so no confusions into which structure you are seeing right so these are the axial sections now if you have any queries regarding the axils we may actually you know discuss this again so what we see here i would just you know revise if you have any questions you can unmute or you can you know try posting here and i would try to reply if i were to uh, you know read your message out there right so what we see here is the superior semicircular canal we start dividing anterior and posterior limbs we start seeing uh, we start seeing them go their go separate ways you see the posterior semicircular canal combining jugular okay let's see we'd come to jugular uh, it's it's seen way inferiorly so it's going to be very inferior i would just go to that again uh, so this is your posterior semicircular canal crest commune and the semicircular canal the superior semicircular canal you see in, go inferiorly you see the internal costal canal labyrinthine segment of facial genu right this is what you see so another way to identify the facial is look at the internal costal canal and you look at the labyrinthine segment of the facial right and then you see your vestibular aqueduct appearing then you have the signet ring appearance of the cochlea you have the vestibular aqueduct you have other structures which we discussed the middle turn of the cochlea high riding jugular bulb parag okay i thought i would avoid this but chalo we'll discuss that because you know when uh i one of my friends actually told me about the jugular bulb high jugular bulb and you know there is a classification and a whole grading for a jugular bulb one two three four which we may discuss in the next lecture which is probably the next sunday but let me just you know try to make it easier for you right now okay so so then you have uh these structures of the vestibule you see the ice cream cone and the tympanic segment of facial the various segments of the cochlea go more inferiorly you see the facial nerve you see the sinus tympana and you see the posterior semicircular canal the cp suprastructure and the secule so you see the oval window right here you go inferiorly you see the round window out here and the sinus tympana and the posterior semicircular canal and you have the facial the stapedius go more inferiorly you start seeing the facial recess now the carotid anteriorly eustachian tube and tensor tympani right and these are the important structures now as we go in field dr nasiba asked and parag dr parag also asked the jugular bulb and when do you really called as uh call as a high jugular bulb okay we can you know some somebody just asking probably mucosal folds sometimes we may if it's a very good structure and not all of them never all of them if it's a very well done ct scan very good resolution you may see them but they are very thin and it's a soft tissue which a ct scan is not made for so it's not easy to see them you will have to really have a good knowledge and to assume that you are seeing it but otherwise no mucosal folds are usually not seen in the kind of ct scans which we have right now we talk about jugular bulb so jugular bulb as we all know internal jugular bulb internal jugular vein when it comes up it forms the jugular bulb and then it goes and forms a sigmoid sinus now it's way posterior if it is a very high lying jugular bulb right abhi to is wale mein the scan which i'm showing you right now is a very low lying jugular bulb right i'm not really worried about this but if my jugular bulb you know this is a carotid this is jugular if this jugular bulb were to reach here right and as per definition you were about to show diagrams yeah i'll show those diagrams i'll i will be showing those diagrams so when we go higher up this is your jugular bulb right and it it goes this way and it goes so high that it starts occluding your view now by de there are multiple definitions of a high jugular bulb for me the most important definition which actually exists in majority of literature is if it is higher than the posterior semicircular canal if it's reaching the posterior semicircular superior semicircular canal and just going above that you call it a high jugular bulb however does it really make a difference to me no not always you know if it if this jugular bulb is reaching as high as the internal acoustic canal sorry the external auditory canal and it is right here just even lateral to the annulus 
this would be a problem to me right if it is so high that it is you know kind of hiding my round window if you know sorry if if it reaches this place and we see these kind of scans and i would show at least in, <coughs> in the next lecture which we have i'll definitely show i still have a few of them with me so if it reaches this place right and it occludes my round window area then it would be an issue for me to do a cochlear implant so it depends on the surgery which you are doing not all high jugular in fact majority of high jugular bulbs are not a problem at all it depends on the surgery if i'm doing a tympanoplasty and if i have a jugular bulb right here and you would ex encounter them that would be a problem for me to elevate the flap if i'm doing in a kind of an entrostomy and if jugular bulb is here it becomes a problem to me again through the posterior tympanotomy so if i want to do cochlear implant it's a problem however my sigmoid sinus if it is forward lying then it becomes a problem and i would show you as we proceed right so this is the jugular bulb and the carotids briefly the coronals because we need to know the coronals we may not usually use them but we need to know them so it will be much you know less detailed coronal sections what do you want to see in the coronal you want to see first is the dural plate now many times i ask my you know postgraduates during the exam also that tell me i would show them the axial section and i would ask them to tell me the dural plate if somebody tries looking for a dural plate in an axial canal not a good axial section not a good thing to do because you are not supposed to see the dural plate in axial sections you would be seeing the dural plate only in the coronals right and this is where you want to see it right these are all the sections which show the tegmen right and this tegmen and then the dural plate area in the mastoid right so if you are looking for a dural plate classically look for them in coronal sections axial sections look for the forward lying sinus you know all these things other than that are less important if you are doing a cortical mastoidectomy you want to see the forward lying sinus and a low lying dural plate that's the most important thing to start off your surgeries right if you miss out on those you would anyhow be in a problem yeah chandrika i will come to a low lying dural plate right uh, so uh, what you what you really see is you know if you have a dural plate dural brain hanging like this or a dural plate which is low lying i would you know show a few pictures of what i mean by low lying dural plate basically what it means is if i were to try to open up my antrum here and then you know go from here towards the antrum the wider the space i have in this area the easier it is for me i would show you a few scans where they are very close together and that would obviously make it difficult that's one of the things right which dural plate in the coronal sections which you want to see do not look for dural plate in axial sections that's 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 very bad i mean that that's just what looks like that you don't know your scans so dural plate has to be seen in the coronal sections right then when you see this cochlear structure right you have the carotid so as i told you anteriorly is the carotid especially when you're looking at coronal sections you're looking for glomus jugular kind of things that's where your carotid and jugular come into place anteriorly carotid anteriorly cochlea right you see all this so when you see something near the cochlea it's always the carotid you would not see jugular near the cochlea so don't be don't say this is the jugular because you sometimes you know we get you uh, tend to get confused and these two dots the facial right you see the tympanic segment let me click here you see the tympanic segment see the axial section see uh, tympanic segment and then you labyrinthine segment again in the same section so labyrinthine and the tympanic segment they are very close together so what you see in a coronal section are these two eyes right and these are the tympanic and the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve okay so then we go more posterior you still see the carotid you still see the cochlea you see how near the cochlea comes to the carotid that's what becomes important and you, when when i'm talking about the labyrinthine segment and the facial they are again coming very near together right and we had a recent publication on the same about the this distance which is very important when dealing with ossified cochlea the most important section of the whole of coronal part for me is this one it gives you an idea of a dural plate how much a space do you have between your canal and the dura 
right so this is where you go in second you see these structures now this is the lateral semicircular canal so when you open the entrum from here you want to see your lateral semicircular canal vestibule you have the origin of the superior semicircular canal out here right superior canal horizontal canal and then the cochlea so you see all this with the internal cochlear canal obviously in this particular section so and the other important structure which you see is this because this is the area of the vestibule that is where you are seeing the secule right when we just discussed secule lies in relation to the stapes so this is where you start seeing your stapes and the stapes would go here and this would hit the secule right here and when you are doing your autosclerosis or dealing with tympanic segments right what you see out here is the tympanic segment of the facial right you see this relation of the tympanic segment of the facial to the lateral semicircular canal again very well seen inferior right you see this lateral segment saying scutum yeah i'll come to mithula i'm coming to scutum right now so you have the lateral semicircular canal you have the facial here tympanic segment you have the stapes head here right and you have your secule the cochlea now this is the area of scutum that's why i said this is the most important section for me cut half an hour in the coronal sections so you have this you have the scutum the dural area where you will enter you have the scutum if it this gets eroded here if it gets blunted here you're looking for a cholestatoma if you look for the semicircular canal and the tympanic segment if it is dehiscent then you would actually see three planes not here okay now let me just go back click on this this is where your secule is present i hope that's clear to you nadia right we saw this during our this thing right that's a secule area that's your area of the tympanic segment of facial go one one section below this you would see the secule yet okay so you have to put this here you are still seeing the secule only right so secule is big structure right the sole of vestibule keep on clicking and you will see the various parts of secule and you see the stapes here you see the stapes here also right so you see the stapes in both the sections and that's where your round oval window would be opening right and this is a tympanic segment of the facial if you want to see it hanging if it's hanging more than half uncovered with bone many people could like to call it as dehiscent but this is the most important section of all see the scutum as dr mithul mentioned you see the canals you see the facial you see the oval window you see the carotid right you also see the hypotympanum cells you know that's where even the hypotympanum anterior you would see the eustachian tube so you want to see this section go more posterior you start seeing your mesotympanum and then the area of the vestibule right and this is what the appendicular would look like the facial still being present the semicircular canal in the entrum you know when you open that up and the internal costal canal so not much important to see all these structures the only structure which now becomes important is go very posterior really back out there and what you start seeing is the facial nerve you know so if i want to look at the full length of the vertical segment and you want click on it you see you know you see the green dot in axial obviously axial would cut your vertical segment so you would see it only as a green dot so you see the vertical segment of the facial go one segment inferior and you still see the mastoid segment of the vertical segment of the facial right so facial is seen very posterior you want to see that right there right so this is where you would see your vertical segment of facial posteriorly that's the only important thing other than obviously the jugular so posteriorly is the area of jugular and that's where your you know the glomus etc would again come into view and maybe we can discuss that later some day but for the normal anatomy the most important structure is the mastoid segment of facial and you click on it and you keep seeing the vertical segment everywhere you wish to in the axial and in the sagittal sagittal i would just avoid right now it's you know not something which is really we follow and we really need to know that so this is the whole gist of the axial and the coronal sections right and if you really want me to repeat anything we would again repeat it for now let's go back to the presentation right and to understand i really love using this diagram you know if if you were to cut an axial section at this level the first thing you see is the superior semicircular canal you go more inferior coronal posterior to anterior no we we would like to read coronal anterior to posterior i am always happier that way you may actually read it the other way around if you wish to right nobody can stop you from that 
but for me it's always anterior to posterior it's way easier to read it you know and all the important structures lie you know anteriorly so you would love to go anterior to posterior usually however if you want to do that nobody can stop you right it's, it's your wish it's, it's always you know whichever way you are comfortable but the normal traditional way is anterior to posterior for coronals right so we have the axial section at this level we see the superior semester canal then we go here and we see the two limbs separating we go one level below and we see the crust commune so this one diagram is actually very nice and you can actually you know imagine where you are going down the way from superior to inferior if you see this diagram along with your ct scan this will make it very easy for you to understand the things now again have a look at where your oval window here is your cochlea starts from here cochlea starts from here your vestibule is here right and that's where it is in relation to your secule right and this is your round window where it's right opening where the basal turn is starting so this is the sections now look at this cut right if this were the disease and i have to deal with this if this is where my you know the antrum or the diseased area is lying and i want to go in from here this is a very forward lying sigmoid sinus right and this is what would create issues for me if i want to open the interim and when i see this i would be really happy to go inside out right because going outside in and opening the interim here would be a very tricky job even in the best of hands you may actually damage this sigmoid sinus and let it bleed and then you have to really manage that so instead go inside out and you will be very happy to deal with the, this kind of a mastoid right oh, i did not push the load you will pay okay i'll try to get it now there's another term which you should know and that is called as partial volume averaging why is it that important you see you look at this facial you know it does look dehiscent right you don't see any bony covering over it so is it dehiscent similarly when you look at ct pns you would many a times you know feel that there is no cribriform plate out here and there is if there is a, if there is a history suggestive of csf you may assume this to be a defect in the ct pns which it is not so what is partial volume averaging you know ct scan is ultimately a software it it takes various sections at various levels however if this thickness of various sections is is very high you may actually the the software would actually average it out you know so a bone and a soft tissue which are nearby would not be really seen as separate bone and separate soft tissue the software would do an averaging of this and therefore you tend to see them as dehiscent so many a times your radiologist would report a dehiscent facial nerve or a defect in the cribri form which is not the reality right and that's not what we see okay yeah let me just go back to why the middle turn is the fun which we see okay so for that let me just go to this software again All right let me just stop this from playing okay why is the middle turn the thing which we see the first okay 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 i hope just i am able to put this in the right perspective fine why do we see the middle turn as the first thing okay little guy little guy so you see this this is your little semester canal right and it has to be in that plane okay so you you have to go 30 degrees tilt okay let me try if i can make this tilt okay so this is what it would look like you know okay exactly the way it is so this is where so your vertical segment is not vertical your tympanic segment of facial is not horizontal it these are all at 30 degrees or something like that and when you're looking at the ct scan of the cochlea again your middle turn you know when you look at this from above your middle turn so it's, it's the basal turn would start somewhere from here it, it doesn't start from here the basal turn starts from here and when you go right from here to this level it starts finishing right here and the middle turn just starts beginning from here and the middle turn would continue from here till here and then the epical turn would start from here to here right 
So basal turn starts here. It's not a circle you're looking at. You're looking at a spiral, right? A spiral has different angulations. So you go from here, you go this, it finishes at 360 degrees somewhere here. So what you start seeing from here is the middle turn now. Middle turn would go from here, finish off here, right? And then the apical turn would go and finish off here, right? Okay, so I hope, you know, you will have to really go into it. But as you go and read about it more, you would realize that it's always a middle turn which comes first and it's not as difficult to really acknowledge it later on. Quadrant tympani can be seen on a CT scan if it is very well defined in the bony covering. I think Dr. Nadia just asked. But it's not that you would see it always, right? Again, you need very good sections for this to be seen. Right, another question. As postgraduates or even for me, I should be knowing is what is the radiation dose? Chest X-ray 0 0.05 millisecond. Actually, temporal bone is 4 to 7 and usual background radiation annually, you know, when we are walking around is around 2.5 millisecond. So it's not like it's a very high this thing. So one year and the one half an hour is much more. If you do a CT scan repeatedly, that's why we don't want to do an HIV temporal bone in children. And we are rather happy to do a cone beam CT. Now, what is a cone beam CT? It's usually a dental thing, right? Dentists are the one who have been using it day in, day out. It does give much lesser radiation, very good resolution, and especially for autosclerosis or post cochlear implant. This is a very good thing to have. Very less artifacts, and you know, it requires much lesser space and power, two minutes, right? Now, though this is not again in the gambit, but if you're looking for cholesteatoma, the things which I want you to mention are, it's a soft tissue mass in the non-dependent area with those erosions and it is not enhancing, but we cannot distinguish a CT scan, will never distinguish all these things, cholesteatoma, granulations, fibrosis, etc. And that is why we want an MRI. And then we discuss initially, DW MRI is what we are looking at and a non-EPI, DW is way better and the recent thing which is coming in is ADC apparent diffusion coefficient mapping right and if it shows this value then it's for sure a cholesteatoma for now a non-EPI DW for example look at these two both these things look pretty similar you get a diffusion restriction only on the left side so it's only on the left that you have a cholesteatoma the right does not have a cholesteatoma, so obviously it makes sense to operate on the left. And people have now replaced two minutes. Replaced a second look surgery in that canal wall to rather a MRI. So an MRI can be good enough for an entire canal wall follow-up. You don't need to do a second look. In many studies, this is what they have proven. So non-EPI DW MRI is presently the best. We may see the ADC thing, ADC thing coming up soon. Last thing, two other planes. We know the axial coronal sagittals, the stenvers and the poscal. Stenver is, you know, when it is running perpendicular to the cross of superior semicircle, that's parallel to the petrous apex, right? And this is what the superior semicircle canal would look like. And the posterior, poscal plane is perpendicular to the petrous and to the plane of superior semicircle canal. So your superior would be seen something like this. So these are the two names, Poscal and Stenvers, right? Just that you should be knowing it, not that you would be doing it very often. But if you're looking for superior semicircular canal dehiscence, you need to ne know that these two planes exist. And this is a book which we worked on and, you know, various friends really contributed to it. And I'm really thankful because of that, I really got to read a lot and, you know, reading the radiology. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shreya sir and Dr. Jankiram and you know, if there are still questions left, we can again discuss those and, you know, uh, plan it out and, you know, discuss it again. Thank you. Yabby. Okay, then question. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, you have answered most of the questions in the chat section. So I tried doing that. Posted at the relevant times and you have cleared them immediately. 
Uh, so we will do one thing, sir. We will open up the chat option. I mean, uh, unmute options for everybody. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if they have any personal questions, we can take up for another uh, 10, 15 minutes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I'm enabling the unmute option. So request everybody to, uh, uh, you know, either raise your hand or uh, ask questions one by one. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. This is Chandrika, sir. Hey. Uh, sir, can you please explain the thickness of the stapes foot plate? Uh, what is the normal foot plate thickness in autosclerosis? How, we, how will it be present? Okay, so, you know, I was thinking of including autosclerosis in this talk, but, you know, we decided let's just keep it as normal anatomy. And, uh, you know, I might include that in the next talk which we have. However, sure. however, considering that you have asked it, let me, you know, uh, try adding that. I have a few pictures of that in the same uh, presentation, but I had actually hidden those slides. There are various, you know, classifications which exist for it. Okay, I'll just take a minute and, you know, if I could share my screen again. Oops, how do I share my screen again? Okay. So, 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 if you could see that, right, Chandrika, so, you know, there are various gradings for autosclerosis and uh, if you want to look for autosclerosis, you would actually want to look at an area anterior to the oval window. That's the we know that, right? Fissula interfenestra. So, we want to look at a bit anterior to the oval window. We all know we saw that, right? This is your, this is your secular area. That's your oval window, right? This is a Hello. normal thing which we are seeing. Now, when you're looking at autosclerosis, you want to see, thanks Asim, you want to see this part, right? Not the oval window. That's your stapes foot plate. This would usually appear normal in your initial cases. Initial, you know, the patient has just started complaining. Oops. Oops, sorry. So if I were to, you know, so this is the area of autosclerosis. This is your secule. This is your, one minute. This is your stapes foot plate. When you start seeing this hypodense area, right? Normally you would not see anything, right? This is your otic capsule which is thick white in appearance when it becomes autospongiotic it sh starts showing grayish so it is not as thick a bone now foot plate would appear pretty normal and as it really progresses you know this may start damaging the various structures in the cochlea spread across the promontory even involve the whole of cochlea but these are rare things 90 percent of the times or rather more than that you would see this hypotense area. So what do you want to do? You want to look at the area of secure. You want to look at the your stapes foot plate. Imagine where it would be. You, can, you may not see it as clearly all the time. But the area just anterior to that in probably in relation to what seems like a promontory. It is not a promontory you really in reality. But this hypotense area is the autosclerosis. Right? This is where you want to look for. Not that I would be worried about my thickness here, but this would just make my foot plate fixed because of the fixation of autosponges, which is seen here. You would not see autosponges very easily in this part. It would just be the anterior part which is initially involved and this is where it gets fixed. So you would not see any difference in it. I would try that I get, I have do have those, you know, cone beam images of an autosclerosis, which is, you know, beautiful picture. Also, there have been studies done by Dr. Arun Gadar in US, right? And he uses negative images of this section where you actually see the foot plate in a much better manner and the autosclerosis is seen even in the foot plate. But the CT scans which we have normally, you would see a normal foot plate. You would just see it. If it is thickened, right? 
you would start seeing the images right here it would get thicker here and then it would be thicker here so then it slowly starts protruding into the secule otherwise you don't see any changes the only thing which you see is right now right here okay uh, then we uh, see uh, how to see for the isolated cochlea isolated cochlea what do you mean by an isolated cochlea it's, it's uh, where the cochlear nerve and okay. the cochlea itself is not in continuation okay why there, there there is a bony plate between that nerve and nerve is there the cochlea is there but both are not connected to each other okay so why that that you won't be able to see in a ct scan you really want to get an mri because a nerve will never be seen in a ct scan right and uh, no sorry and uh, if you really want to see that and i would be discussing this when you when you when we have the next talk that's on cochlear implant radiology uh, okay i don't know it's not moving is is that's where i would be discussing the mri a bit and that's where we can see but this is the area of the cochlea right and the similar area in mri is where you would not see the cochlear nerve but you would see the basal turn you would see the middle and the apical turns right and this is where your interlocustic canal is just going from here so your cochlear yeah. nerve would be falling if you want to just see the cochlea this is where you want to see if you want to yeah. see so your you know the division between the cochlea and the interlocustic canal if you could see this white structure in between yeah. right, right this this okay it's just that it's this white area between yeah. this blue and the pink this is the yeah. area of the lamina cribrosa you really oh. want to see it intact if there is no white area if it's all grayish or blackish that means the lamina cribrosa is defective and if it's a um, malformed cochlea you are dealing with there is almost 100% a csf gusher you are expecting to see right mm -hmm. so you want that there should be some division between the cochlea and the interlocustic canal which is mm -hmm. actually called as the lamina cribrosa so if you look at this structure again the interlocustic canal is here your modulus is what is separating it the base of the modulus is what we call as the lamina cribrosa so your mm -hmm. modulus which is present here is separating it from the cochlear structures if this is absent yeah. that is where you have csf gushers coming in so that's what you don't want to see right and I, we would be discussing mri in the next you know talk okay. and i would be able to show you those sections of mri which you know show the chances of gusher being more thank you thank you sir Okay, anything else or are we done? Any more questions from the audience? I think uh, we are pretty much, yep. Uh, sir, in regular CT, what we get in OPD, there is a in, in coronal sections the scutum will be uh, like a blunt in some sections. It's not a sharp in all sections. How can we differentiate? It is eroded or it is normal showing the sections are uh, blunt. Mm. And that's a confusion which happens at times, you know. But uh, the section which I showed you, where you could see, I hope you remember that, you know, where we could see the semicircular, the lateral, and the superior, and the cochlea i would usually want to see my scutum very sharp out there you know it's usually sharper in other areas also now you know when you are seeing a blunted scutum anywhere in any of the sections with the soft tissue in the middle ear right you have to always think that it may still be a bone eroding disease right because there may be a partial scutum destruction which would make it blunt in few areas and not in all the sections. But if in majority, you see it's sharp enough, then it's it's considered normal for me. If there is no soft tissue in the middle ear, obviously, then again, it's normal for me, right? But 
If it is a soft tissue in the middle ear with majority of sections showing blunting, then it's obviously probably a cholesterol if you're not suspecting anything else, right? But it can be blunt at times, you know, with the chronic disease which has now become stable, you know, slight blunting of the annulus. We see those attic dimples which have progressed a bit, you know, and you can have those few erosions in the scutum somewhere, but that's not what you see always. So one or two sections and other four or five showing normal scutum sharp is not that I would be really worried about. Thank you. Sir, good morning. Dr. Rikta here. Hi. Sir, actually I wanted to know uh, in traumatic facial palsy cases, longitudinal versus transverse fracture, in which cases we can help by uh, doing facial nerve decompression through mastoid uh, by exposing the mastoid root or where um, we cannot help. So, so, so the world is divided, right? In fact, I, I don't decompress almost 90% of my post trauma facial palsy patients. I would say rather more than that. In fact, it's been, I used to do a lot of facial nerve decompressions for uh, temporal bone fractures and now I don't and I just follow them over, you know, follow them up for over two, two, three or sometimes four months. And let me tell you, all of them get better. Yeah. I mean, in my personal experience, I am done with facial nerve decompressions. The only indication when I would still go ahead and, you know, decompress a facial would be when I really see a bony chip impinging on the facial nerve in the horizontal or tympanic segment, you know, which is, which, and a grade six facial palsy, not at all improving with steroids, you know, and uh, nerve conduction test showing again 90% degeneration other things <laughs> come into place. But trust me, we don't need to do them as much as we do. It's, there have been quite a few studies now which actually show that you don't need to decompress majority of facial nerves. In fact, there's a paper by Dr. Alok Thakkar from Ames and, you know, he, he mentioned that uh, there was no difference in results when it came to temporal bone, you know, fractures. He did talk about the non-displaced fractures, but majority of them are non-displaced. So, you know, it's not really required. But if you do see a grade 6 facial palsy, not improving at all, and you see a CT scan, you know, classically showing a bony pitch impinging onto the facial, which is, you know, almost never seen, you, you would then probably go ahead and decompress. For me, no. The first thing when I see a post-trauma facial palsy is just to look for hearing. Because hearing is what, you know, if there's an SNHL steroid might help or internal hypnotics might help. Facials do improve. I, in last three years or so, I'm yet to see a facial post trauma, which has not improved. So for me, almost, you know, very, very limited role, if no role, if I could say no role of, you know, facial of decompression. That's what it is. Thank you, sir. Sir, is steroid for how long we can go for in such okay, so cases? Okay, so taper it off, but if it's a post trauma, I would yearly give it for almost three weeks and then just wait, they would come out. Three, maximum four weeks, but yeah, usually I taper it down in three weeks, two to three weeks rather. And they come out of it. They do come out of it. And you wait, even if they don't come out completely, just continue physiotherapy, wait for a month or two and you would start seeing them improve. So if you start seeing them improve, do not, uh, you know, operate. If it's already grade six to grade four, don't operate, right? They would improve off. Eventually they all would. Your decompression will not make it any better for them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So the, uh, this is Dr. Vikram from Chandigarh. Hi. So I want to ask that you use only oral steroids or IV steroids you also use? Oral. Only oral. Yeah, I use only oral steroids. I don't admit the patient. I don't do anything. Just 1 mg per, m per kg of prednisolone and I'm done with it. Thank you. It. Yeah, Harsha, and we need to find out a way to share this software. You know, one of the ways could be if you could WhatsApp me I, your email address, I could share it with you on that. And let me just post my mobile number here and, you know, I could share that thing and I'll also share my email just in case you want to mail me and remind me again and again, you know. 
because uh, WhatsApp may go and notice at times. So, yeah, but I would love to share these software. They are very nice softwares, and I still love them. Uh, it's 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 intriguing to play with these softwares. So I would I would share that with you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we'll be meeting you again on next Sunday, and uh, it will be pathology and the cochlear implantation. Thank you, sir. Sir, thanks a lot, and thank, thank you, everyone.